Welcome everybody to the next uh, COVID-19 uh, ECB uh, webinar. Today we are very happy to have Veronica Garrieri from Chicago Booth with us. And actually we have a bit of an unusual setup because uh, she's flanked by her three co-authors that um, I'm sure will take uh, the tough questions at the end. So uh, we have Guido Lorenzoni, Ludwig Straub and Ivan Wernin. Um, and Veronica will take us through her recent research with them on how supply shocks can also uh, affect the demand because of this pandemic and um, give us sort of also a general flavor on the topic. And Veronica doesn't need any introduction. She's a leading macroeconomist and we're all following her research. So without further ado, I pass on to Veronica. Hi, so thanks a lot for inviting me uh, to give this talk. So as uh, Luke mentioned, this is a uh, um, work on the recent pandemic and is joined uh, with uh, Guido Lorenzoni, Ludwig Straub and Ivan Werning. Um, so, oops, frozen here. Um, everybody unfortunately is aware that the current uh, um, COVID-19 pandemic is having a very bad and quick uh, effect on the economy all over the world. I mean, last data that I read yesterday on the on the newspaper is a uh, new 5 million unemployment claims uh, have been uh, um, made uh, last week and uh, 6 million the week before in the US. Uh, and the data are not much better, actually, are not any better in Europe, uh, if, if anything worse, because there the pandemic is more advanced. Um, all governments and central bankers uh, around, around the world, and we know this well, the ECB, but the Fed and uh, all other countries have been uh, realizing that this situation is particularly uh, dramatic and uh, they have been, have been trying to help and to think what they can do uh, to help uh, the economy. Uh, and, and clearly when, uh, when central bankers and governments say we can do whatever, we are willing to do whatever it takes, a natural question that comes, uh, about is, uh, is it uh, a pandemic, a situation, a type of shock for the economy that uh, uh, needs stimulus for spending? Um, and so to frame this question in terms of uh, the textbook macro model, uh, one can, uh, the, the, the natural question that people have been debating is, uh, should we think of a pandemic like COVID-19 uh, as a shock that is primarily uh, about the aggregate supply of the economy or is it a shock that affects mostly the aggregate demand of the economy. This is very important to then think about policy. Our, in our paper, uh, our uh, uh, um, the way in which we approach the problem is, uh, well, let's think about uh, the pandemic. When we think about it, uh, the direct uh, effect that we can think of a pandemic is something that looks more like a supply shock, uh, because either because people, there are some sectors where you know that uh, there is more transmission and so people, consumers and, and workers prefer not to be affected, be in interacting with other people or because of lockdown measures, uh, some sectors of the economy simply shut down. And so there is no production of some goods and services. And so this is a clear supply shock. However, our question is, uh, can this shock that is starts as a supply shock propagate to the economy? in the form of a demand shock? And can the demand component become even larger than the supply? And, and we are going to call uh, um, a, a supply shock that becomes more importantly a demand shock, a change of supply shock. When the demand shock becomes bigger than the initial supply one, we are going to say that this is a change of supply shock. And we are going to use we are going to use some uh, uh, models to show you that a, a series of models where we add ingredients to show you that there are two main ingredients that can transform an, a supply shock in a Keynesian supply shock, so in mostly in demand shock. And these ingredients are first we need multiple sectors, and in particular we need these sectors to be very much complement to each other. And and so when we think about uh, um, uh, different sectors. Uh, we think about some sectors have been shut down, like sh sectors where there is a higher contact among people, like restaurants, hotels, uh, um, and uh, and sectors that may be complement complement to those are sectors like uh, uh, 
uh, if you think about hotels, maybe people decide to buy less luggage or less cars to travel because they cannot go into hotels. Or if you think about restaurants, well, people uh, uh, um, won't buy fancy clothes to go to the restaurant. So naturally, these are not, not all goods are complements. And there are goods that are substitutes. Uh, uh, for example, if you don't go to the restaurant, uh, you may want to do more takeout and so forth. So then we have to evaluate what is the stronger force in the economy. And when complementary complementarities are strong enough, then we are going to have a change. Of the other ingredient is incomplete market, and, and we are going to talk about that. Um, we are going to also mention two additional uh, um, ingredients that can uh, enrich our model and, and amplify the demand effects of supply shock. Uh, first of all, input out linkages across sectors. And second of all, we are going to endogenize business, business exit and show that this can generate cascades that multiply the effect of the original. Um, then we are going to draw some, some uh, uh, policy lessons from our theoretical insights. And first of all, uh, the first point is that, well, when a supply shock becomes mostly a demand shock, clearly a stimulus can help. So monetary policy easing and fiscal policy may be desirable. Uh, but interestingly, we are going to show that for the special nature of this type of shock, uh, the standard fiscal multiplier is going to be smaller than usual. And, and then second, we are going to show that in particular, what is going to be very important uh, element of policy, if we want to think about optimal policy, is social insurance. Uh, so ensure the work in those sectors uh, or the firms that operate in the sectors that are mostly affected by the shutdowns. And then we are going to also uh, think about incentive that another, uh, I'm going to show you that another important component of uh, policies uh, incentivizing firms to preserve job matches, so to do job hurting rather than uh, um, uh, break the matches. And, and, and this is going to be very important, not only for insurance, I mentioned, but also to think about the longer run when the recovery is coming. So let me summarize our main results through this table. Uh, so we're going to consider four variants of, uh, of uh, building up on a, the basic one sector complete market model. Uh, and I'm going to show you when uh, this supply shock that we think is a pandemic can transform into the demand shock. First, I'm going to show you that in the standard one sector complete market model, a supply shock is a supply shock. And, and, and this is a well-known result. I'm just going to do it to set the stage for, uh, for the uh, other results. Then I'm going to introduce incomplete markets. And I'm going to show you that incomplete markets is not going to be enough to make the demand component strong enough to offset the original supply uh, um, effect. Uh, and, and then I'm going to show you that what you really need, so an ingredient that is going to uh, change things around is multiple sectors. If we introduce multiple sector, then uh, we can, uh, even with complete market, then we can have change in supply shocks. Uh, and when we add to the multiple sector framework in complete markets, the results are even stronger, meaning that the, the, the demand effects of supply shock becomes even possible, and the range of parameters for each uh, change in supply shock that can arise is going to be even larger. So uh, let me just the, uh, with the one sector model. In a one sector, supply shock uh, is going to naturally uh, uh, stay a supply shock in a sense that it's going to naturally create an upward pressure on the natural interest rate. Uh, why? Well, because in a sense, it's like uh, some positive news about the future. If you are hit, if you lose your job today and you know that tomorrow you're going to get, get your job back, then what you want to do is you want to borrow to do consumption smoothing. And so this is going to push uh, uh, force towards demand and, and push up interest. This result is going to be strong enough that it's going to survive even when you introduce uh, incomplete markets. Uh, um, because basically what you can do if you, are, if you cannot borrow, well, at most, you just don't, uh, don't borrow anything, but you never go on the other side of saving. So in the end, it's going to be a wash for the people who cannot borrow. But these effects, if there is some people in the economy that can borrow, there is going to be always a positive upward effect on the interest. Once we introduce a multi-sector, we have to think, as I mentioned before, about uh, our goods complement or substitute. Again, if we think about restaurants as a leading example, so restaurant, restaurants are shutting down, we can think of different type of sectors. Some produce goods that are complements to restaurants and some are uh, substitutes. 
take out our, our, our more substitute uh, uh, for restaurants uh, um, and uh, and maybe are more of a, a complement. Uh, if you think about hotels, uh, then uh, um, uh, cars uh, could be uh, another example of complement goods. So uh, what we're going to show is that when the complementarity forces are strong enough, actually then uh, supply shock and become Keynesian. And this is because once, because once you some sector shut down, if uh, uh, there, is, there are goods that are mostly complements to that, then demand for those goods is going to reduce beyond the, uh, uh, the original level, and so there is going to be an additional drop in activity on the top of the sectors that are directly affected by the shutdown. Now, this is with complete market, even when people who are working in the good and in, in the in the affected sector are uh, insured. But if we introduce in complete markets, the effect the effect are going to be even stronger because now workers in the shutdown sector lose their income, and so they have to cut spending even more. So let me show you this intuition. Uh, with a simple, with a with a graphical representation to make it more concrete, uh, just in, imagine, think about two sectors: sector one and sector two. Uh, sector one is the sector where uh, that is uh, more where there are more contacts uh, uh, among people, and so it's the one that is going to be shut down. Sector two is a sector where people can work from home and everything is safe, so it's not going to be shut down after uh, the shock. So before the shock, uh, all the workers, sector one, sector two, get income and they spend both in sector one and sector two. Um, so everything works well. Uh, once we have the shock, we are going to represent the shock as a shutdown of sector one. Sector one is completely locked down. So workers in sector one don't get any income. Um, however, they are insured because we assume here that there are complete markets. So they still have some. Uh, uh, um, uh, resources that they can spend, and so both workers in sector one and sector two are still going to spend in the sector two. The question is, how much are gonna they're going to spend? Are they going to spend as much as before? So the demand in sector two is going to be the same as before the shock, more or less? And the answer to this question, of course, depends on how complementary or substitute uh, the sector. Sector two is relatively to sector one. In particular, if sector two is a mostly com is complement enough to sector one, it may be that the, that the demand in sector two is going to be lower than before, because now there is a less need for those goods. Uh, vice versa, if it's mostly substitute, it could even be that the other way around that there is a, a, a higher demand that offset in part the drop down in the lot. Now let's imagine in a, uh, let's think about incomplete markets. So what happens when we add incomplete markets? Simply workers in sector one are not going to get any income anymore. They are not insured, so they cannot spend in exchange. So now the demand in sector two is going to drop even more, and it's going to drop even more. In, in in particular, if we think about uh, the situation of complements that we considered before, it's going to drop more. But even if goods are a little less complement than before, it still may be that the demand component now dominates because of the, the workers in sector one that don't have any more possibility of spend. Okay, so let me move into the model. Uh, let me start um, with the- Veronica, uh, Veronica yes. sorry to interrupt. Um, could you go back to the previous slide before we go to the model? Just a clarifying question um, from um, Michele Lanza. So could we think of the model, could we think of these sectors also as countries? So especially yeah, so if you think about if you think about EMU, um, if there are input output relationships, for instance, between Italy and Germany, or even Absolutely. more importantly, if if uh, the lockdowns are not synchronized synchronized across countries, could could your mother also speak to that? Absolutely. So yes, I was planning to talk about that later, but this is a natural uh, uh, extension of our model or, or another way of interpreting our model is thinking about different countries, especially in Europe where country are so where, where trade is so integrated. And so uh, you can think about countries that are locking down before uh, than others or they don't and, and, and you're going to have uh, similar uh, similar results. So, yes. And, and and of course, this is an impact on policy, and I can go back to that later when I talk about policy. Yeah, and then um, and there's a, a second question from Florian Haider. What is the role of uncertainty? I mean, you, you yeah. said we can think of this as positive news about tomorrow, but right now people are very much worried about tomorrow. 
Yeah, so we here we 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 want to abstract. Uh, uh, we are going to abstract about uncertainty. Of course, if you add uncertainty into the picture, you are going to have an even stronger demand component uh, that is going to pop up. Uh, but in a sense, uh, and there is, there are many other ingredients in the real world that may add on the demand side. For example, issues and and things like that. I can touch on that. But what what we do here is like more like we want to abstract from many other. Uh, um, uh, reason for uh, demand shortages uh, and try to see purely the supply, what are the, the, the pure effects uh, on the demand coming purely on, from the supply shock. That's why we are going to abstract from uncertainty in this paper, but it's certainly very important. Thanks for clarifying. So let's see the model. Yes. So, um, so let me start from a simple uh, complete markets one sector model. Um, this is again. Uh, uh, these are well-known results, but it's just to set the stage for the next uh, uh, versions of the model. So um, preferences are standard. There is one single consumption good. There is a fixed endowment of labor and barn, and technology is linear. So how do we introduce a pandemic shock? A pandemic is going to be uh, a sh we are going to think about the pandemic as an MIT type of shock. So it's going to be an unexpected shock. The economy is in steady state, and then unexpectedly there is this shock that is going to be temporary in our model, and it's going to last one period. So at time zero, we are going to have a temporary reduction in labor supply. So instead of n bar, the endowment uh, goes down to one minus phi n bar. So phi n bar is the is the size of the shock. And then from time one onwards, we are going to go back to normal to n bar, and that goes back to n bar, and, there, and, and we are uh, thinking about a flexible price allocation. Okay, so uh, the the question is uh, um, one way of thinking about uh, is this a demand or a supply shock in the frame in the term in terms of our model is to think about what is the the pressure on natural interest on the natural interest rate. So think about a flexible price economy, and so let the interest rate adjust. What's gonna happen to the interest rate at time zero if you wanna keep full employment? And then uh, we can simply use the Euler equation of the um, of the consumers to back up what is the interest, the real interest rate, um, knowing that uh, people are gonna be at time zero. The um, consumption has to be equal to. Uh, production that is one minus phi n bar because we are in a representative agent model, so we use market clearing here. And consumption in period two is going to be back to n bar. And so you can see that immediately this tells us that there is going to be an upward pressure on the interest. And then uh, um, another way of, of thinking, and so this is a supply shock in that sense, is a supply shock. Another way of thinking about it is uh, well, let's instead uh, do the opposite exercise. Let's keep interest rate thinks that one over beta the interest at the steady state level of interest rate and so in a sense let's add the downward rigid nominal uh, wages uh, and then uh, let's think about if there is excess demand or, or demand shortages in that case in the in the first period okay so this exercise is useful especially if you want to think about a zero lower bound the kind of, of environment where you cannot actually adjust freely the interest rate and uh, uh, if you look at the same error equation and then you plug in the interest rate one over beta, you can back up what is the demand for in period uh, zero. And the demand in period zero turns out to be equal to n bar, like in the second period. And if the interest rate is the same of the, um, of the steady state, one over beta. And so this means clearly that there is an excess demand because we know that production needs to be one over phi n bar because there has been a shock. And so I can summarize this result in one sector of complete market, uh, in a one sector complete market model, a negative supply shock is a ne negative supply shock in the sense that generated an increase in the natural rate, or in other words, any, uh, generate an increase excess demand if the interest rate is. What's the intuition? Well, the intuition is, uh, as I mentioned before, the idea is that if you have a negative supply shock today, it's good news for the, for the future. At some point, maybe not tomorrow, there may be uncertainty for when it's going to be, but at some point we know that we are going to go back up. And so what agents want to do if we are in a standard stylized uh, one sector model, they want to borrow, not save. So that's why there is an upper pressure on the enough. Now, can incomplete market save us uh, and kind of overcome uh, these uh, uh, upward pressure on the interest? So let's see. So. Uh, we introduce incomplete market in a, the simplest possible way. So we're going to use a 
simple version of the model because we want to emphasize the mechanism and then we can think about how extent i mean generalizable these results are so let me start with incomplete math so um we are going to have uh, agents uh, that have uh, access to a zero net supply one period bond uh, it's going to be aip this is the budget constraint for agent i um, and uh, we are going to assume that a fraction new of the agents face a border constraint. So new agents are going to be constrained. One minus mu of the agents are not going to be constrained. And the ones that are going to be constrained are going to be cannot borrow at all. So AIP needs to be false. Okay. Uh, and then the heterogeneity dimension comes uh, also in another dimension that is uh, about the shock, how, who is going to hit by the shock. So each agent has a labor endowment, NIT, that is equal to N bar. And uh, when the shock happens, so when there is this uh, uh, drop in the, in the labor supply in the economy, some agents are going to be affected, some agents are not going to be affected. So five of the agents are going to be affected and are going to have a labor endowment goes down to zero. The others are unaffected. Okay. So let me, first of all, let me say that. Uh, 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 this mu help us span the um, different extreme of the economy. So when mu is a zero, we have no constrained agents. The model boils down to the uh, represent to the complete market version that I've just uh, described. When mu is equal to one, we have the extreme uh, where everybody is constrained. Okay. Um, so how we think about the effect of the shock in this economy? So we have to think about two sets of agents. There is one set, small, I mean, one set that is the new phi of the agents are going to be the ones that are affected by the shock, so that they lose their labor supply, but they are also constrained. So if they're constrained here because they cannot borrow at all, their income will go to zero, they're going to consume zero. Right? So they're kind of boring. We can kind of, for the analysis, we don't really need that. So let's focus instead of the other agents in the economy. Who are the other agents in the economy? Well, on the one hand, there are the other affected agents who are unconstrained. So these agents can actually borrow from the other agents who are uh, unaffected and are willing to lend to them. Okay. And then there are uh, the unaffected agents who are, could be both, face both the constraint or not, but the constraint is not going to be relevant for them because they are not uh, at the uh, hit by the shock. So all these agents are going to group together, and uh, they each of them can be uh, the, the behavior of each of these agents can be represented by a standard Euler equation, and then uh, thanks to homotetic preferences, can aggregate these into an aggregate Euler equation that is uh, uh, C, that is uh, looks exactly the same of a standard Euler. Equation. Um, and then uh, once we have that, we are going to think about what's going to be the effect on the interest rate. And so we have to plug in what is, uh, again, let's do the same exercise as before. Let's think that the, we are in a flexible price economy and, it, and, and then let's let the natural rate adjust and uh, let's see if there is upward or downward pressure. Well, if we do that and we want to keep the economy at full employment, C0 needs to be equal to 1 minus pi and bar. So this is the endowment at the time of the shock. And then in period one, what's the demand? This is the market clearing condition. What's the demand for uh, uh, goods? Well, it's going to be C1, the demand from the unaffected and unconstrained, plus new phi and bar. This is the demand from the people who are constrained and affected at time zero, who are at the zero uh, lower bound and sorry at the zero uh, constraint and so uh, now they're going to spend everything that they get uh, uh, from back uh, from endowment and then this has to be equal to n bar that is the supply of labor and so from here we can back up uh, what is uh, um, what is c1 plugged into the earlier equation and see that again there is an upward pressure on the interest rate meaning the natural interest rate is going to be higher than one over beta so to summarize, again, one sector model, even within complete markets, a negative supply shock is going to generate a, a rise in, in the interest rate, or, or uh, we can do the same exercise as before. If we kept the uh, interest rate fixed, uh, we're going to have an excessive. So again, why? Well, the reason is uh, basically the same as before. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, now there is this negative supply shock. Again, P, uh, agents that are not affected by the shock uh, there is no problem for them, but agents who are affected by the shock, they, well, then they want to borrow, and so they're going to put, ones who are constrained, they cannot borrow, but they're not going to save. So at the most, they're just dampening the effect of the others. 
In fact, in the limit where everybody constrain, is constrained, there is going to be no change in the unit. All right, now, uh, so we saw that with one sector model, we are not going to go very far. So with one sector model, a supply shock is a supply shock, so it doesn't seem that stimulus uh, should be very uh, useful uh, if we think purely about uh, this uh, standard effect. Uh, let's then uh, introduce an, an ingredient that, that we think is natural if we think about the COVID, that is multiple sector. Why, again, we think of multiple sectors are natural? Well, because some sector, we are, we are going to think about lockdowns, and we are going to think that some sectors are going to shut down, but other sector may still be um, May, um, may still be active in the economy, and so we want to understand if the effect of the of the original shock is going to limit to the uh, sectors that are shut down, or is going to spread over into the other sector. So we are going to do that uh, with a simple uh, two uh, period, uh, sorry, two sector model first, and then this can be generalized. But oh, one thing I didn't mention in terms of generalization: the result that I gave you before that with one sector model incomplete market is not uh, gonna make it to uh, to generate tension supply shock is very general so can be generalized easily to more general framework of incomplete market okay so um we can add this is just so the, the result of one sector model is uh, and, and the intuition is clear because it's the same as before if you have some constraint i mean at most you're gonna kind of reduce the increase in interest rate but you're not going to generate within complete markets alone a force to create downward pressure on this. Okay, so now two sectors, C1 and C2. Again, this is generalizable to a continuum of sector, and I'm going to show you this at the end. Uh, and uh, how do we um, uh, model the preferences? So we're going to think that there is a constant uh, intertemp uh, elasticity of substitution, both intertemporal and intratemporal across sectors. Right, so one over rho is the elasticity of substitution across sectors. One over sigma is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. Um, technology is linear in both sectors. So let's first focus on the steady state. So in the steady state, so um, consumption in sector one is going to be equal to uh, production in sector one is market clearing, and production in sector one is going to be equal to phi and bar. So we are going to assume that uh, uh, phi of the total endowment, uh, um, a share phi of the total endowment is allocated to sector one, and one minus phi of the total endowment is allocated to sector one. Okay, this is by assumption, and then consumption is equal to production, that is equal to uh, phi and bar. And one minus phi and bar. Notice that we picked, we chose this phi that's uh, defined the share of endowment uh, of labor in the two sector being the same of the phi that is in the preferences, uh, um, that is the, the kind of the weight on the two bundle of uh, goods, phi to the raw and one minus phi to the raw. And we do that exactly to normalize the, the price, the relative price of the two sectors to one. So P star is going to be equal to one by choice of the normalization. Now, how can we think about the, the uh, pandemic shock in this uh, two-sector model? Um, we are going to think about that as an asymmetric MIT shock. And so, uh, temporary again. And so, we are going to think that the pandemic is going to completely shut down sector one. So, again, the size of the shock is phi and bar because the size of sector one is Okay, The sector one is going to shut down. So, consumption, production, labor is all equal to zero at time zero in sector one. Now, how about uh, uh, the effect on the rest of the economy? So we are going to think, uh, to think about what is going to be the effect on the interest rate, we are going to think about uh, the real interest rate in terms of good two, for good two. So uh, why is that? Why we pick good two? Well, because uh, um, the interest rate uh, uh, for good, so good two is a good in our simple version of the, in, in our simple model where there is downward wage rigidity, Basically, is a, is a good for which there is no inflation. So the uh, real interest rate is going to be equal to the natural interest rate. So it's interesting to look at that. Uh, and also, a good one is going to be a good that disappears from the economy. So the price is not going to be it's going to jump up to infinity. So it, it makes more sense to think uh, for or to think in terms of good too. But the result is uh, more general, and I'm going to go back to that later um, when we talk about inflation. So. Uh, Again, uh, here we have a multiple sector complete market. 
So we are going to have an, an, an Euler equation uh, and we are going to, um, for, good, for good two, and we are going to look at this Euler equation and we're going to plug in what is the consumption at time zero and at time one in, in sector one and sector two. In sector one, consumption at time zero is going to be zero by the shock. And, and the sector two is going to be, uh, is going to be, um, uh, the, the consumption sector two is going to be C2 star. Um, and then similarly, at time, at time one, we are going to go back uh, to the um, uh, flexible price uh, uh, N bars. So we are going to go back to the steady state level of consumption. And you can see that once this is the case, uh, we plugged in this, uh, this number, we obtain that the, the interest rate, uh, there, is, there can be a proportional downward on the interest rate under some parameters. And in particular, the result is that uh, when we have a model with multiple sectors and complete market, market, uh, markets, the negative supply shock uh, becomes a Keynesian supply shock in the sense that uh, generates a, a downward pressure on a natural rate when one over sigma is bigger than one over rho. So when the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is bigger than the elasticity of substitution across sectors. And why, how can we interpret this, uh, this uh, result? Well, we can think about it in two different ways from two different angles. Let's first like uh, um, fix sigma, the elasticity of intertemporary substitution and think about in terms of uh, complementarity across sectors. Then the condition tells us if one over row is small enough, uh, then uh, there is, uh, the, the demand effects become strong. And, and this is natural because this means that if the two sectors are complement enough, then there is going to be a feedback of demand of sector two coming from the shutdown of sector one. As I described before, if restaurants closed, then people are not going to buy new clothes. And so this is going to uh, um, have an impact on demand for the sector, the other sector. The other way of thinking about it is, uh, well, let's fix the raw, the complementarity across sectors. Well, when the elasticity of substitution is large enough, then we are going to have, uh, um, again, demand uh, shock dominates. So why is that? Well, one way of thinking about that is that we know that today some goods just disappear. So if you can substitute consumption between today and tomorrow freely, or, or, or you are eager to do that because the elasticity of sub intertemporal substitution is large enough, well, then you want to substitute that. So you want to consume more tomorrow because tomorrow some goods are going to go back into the picture. Okay, so these goods that you really would like to consume today, that have an infinite price today, you, you can consume. Okay, And uh, this is a graphical representation of this condition. So you can see that uh, the, the uh, pink area is uh, the, the shaded and pink area is the area uh, of the uh, parameter space where we have one over on the x axis and one over sigma on the y axis where Keynesian supply shocks arise. And the other areas where this pandemic is just a simple regular supply. And again, we can restate the result in terms of deficient excess demand if we just fix the interest rate. Now, how about in complete markets? So, uh, if we intro if we add on top of the multiple sectors in complete markets, what happens? Well, let's do again that in a, a, um, keep the same structure of incomplete market model as we did before. We have now a fraction mu of the agents who are constrained, one man and mu who are not constrained, and phi of the uh, workers are going to be affected, and one minus phi are not going to be affected by the shock. So again, we can focus on the unaffected and unconstrained workers to think about the effect uh, um, on the interest rate. And uh, in this case, you can see that the Euler, this is the Euler equation written in terms of the interest rate at time zero. And then uh, you can see that what is C to zero? So C to zero is the consumption in sector uh, uh, two at time zero. If uh, again, the, we let the natural rate adjust and to keep the uh, full employment, this has to be equal to one minus phi and bar, which is the total uh, uh, employment uh, and production in, in um, at time zero. And then how about consumption in two sectors sector in, uh, in uh, time one? Well, the total, uh, 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 we are going to have one minus phi mu times n bar as a total uh, uh, income. And then phi of that is going to go uh, to um, uh, sector one and one minus phi. So this is going to be, uh, this, this can show once we plug this into the other equation that there is going to be a um, downward pressure of the natural interest rate for a larger, for looser conditions than before, for a larger set of parameter spaces, so when uh, um, than than before. 
before, and you can see that uh, in this uh, graph before in the pink shaded area, uh, we could we uh, uh, the pandemic shock uh, was occasional supply shock. Now this area becomes blue, becomes bigger. It includes this triangle on the right. This is drawn for the case where mu is equal to one, so where everybody is constrained. If you mu goes uh, is zero, we go back to the pink shaded area. But with mu in the middle, we are just adding a slice of the triangle. Okay? So this means that even uh, in cases where one over rho um, uh, bigger than one over sigma. You could have, so for example, uh, here I'm showing you some parameters uh, for which one over rho is bigger than one over sigma. And so where in the case of complete markets, uh, you have uh, um, that a pandemic is a simple supply shock. And so you have an output gap that is uh, positive in the non-shocked se shocked sector. Then uh, if you introduce enough marketing completeness, so if new the fraction of agents who are constrained increases enough, then this is going to, a transform in a Keynesian supply of sh uh, shock in a sense the output gap in the non affecting sector to start to be negative. And the law, and interestingly enough, for parameters uh, for which the shock is larger, so for phi larger, where you have a bigger boom in the case of complete market, uh, you're gonna, in sector two, you're gonna have a bigger bust uh, uh, once you have enough uh, uh, marketing. Okay. So uh, I have now uh, completed the, my, my table. So uh, just to sum up, I've model and uh, complete markets uh, or incomplete markets, uh, a pandemic is a simple supply shock. Once we introduce a multiple sector, uh, then uh, we, even with complete markets, Occasional supply shock, maybe even so, the demand effects of the supply shock may be even larger uh, when we have uh, uh, incomplete uh, on top of uh, uh, multiple sectors. So now uh, let's think about uh, uh, policy. Veronica, yep. Veronica, before we move to policies, there were two questions coming in. Yep. Uh, so one is on the, the which in, in, in the model is sort of a spillover, right? It's a Kind of uh, exogenous technological complementarity. The question is whether this could also so specifically Florian Hyde is saying right now I cannot go to restaurants, but that also means I voluntarily avoid other sectors. Down also makes people not want to go to other sectors. Could this endogenous reaction be an alternative to the more technological complementarity you're considering? So, yeah, sure. I mean, that, that, that's a, a little bit my next point after I talk about policy, I'm going to talk about that. So the complementarity of sectors I'm going to talk, I talked about here, I just modeled in a very simplest way as, pre, as part of the preferences. But I agree with Florian, you can think about the complementarities in a broader sense. And one way of thinking is what Florian mentioned about like endogenous decision about uh, uh, other, um, I mean, the endogenous feedback effect of what happens in one sector to the other. But another way of thinking about it uh, is to think also about input output linkages across sectors is another way of thinking about complementarities. And, and I'm going to go there in a, in a few minutes. So I totally agree. Complementarities, you don't want to take that. Uh, as a simple parameter that you look in the data in a standard model, but it's something that is broader than that. Okay. And then um, the second question that came in is uh, by Christoph Camps. He's asking whether your paper now reviving um, the law of markets by SAY, so SAY's law, which basically was about uh, a fall in supply destroying demand. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, we, we mentioned that uh, in the paper. Um, yeah, we mentioned that in the paper. I mean, we think that uh, we have a different in, in, in interpretation, I mean, a different take on that, but uh, we mentioned that, that, uh, that there is a link to that. Yeah. Okay, and then there were two further <laughs> smaller questions. One is by Luca Dedola, whether um, in the incomplete markets version of the model, also the persistence of the shock matters? Uh, uh, yes, we are here. We have a pure temporary shock, so it's only mm -hmm. one period shock. But if you if you uh, embed a more uh, 
uh, shock with persistency for sure that that would be important too. Okay, and then the last question by Philip Hartmann is um, whether um, sort of the distribution, uh, if you had more than two sectors, right, if the distribution of uh, containment policies matters. So, for instance, if all sectors operate only at 20% because everybody is working from home with low productivity, because it's on a form containment policy, would the balance between demand effects relative to supply effects change? So you're saying uh, if uh, each sector operates at a lower uh, intensity, then... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. so if it was more of a uniform thing across sectors, oh, sort of a partial lockdown. Yeah. Uh, we are gonna. I'm gonna show you a more general model at the end if I have time uh, uh, with a continuum of sector, and then you can interpret that uh, um, more broadly as uh, an intensive measure of, of activity if you want. But yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how about policy? So the first uh, uh, thing, uh, like let's just think about a simple uh, policy like government spending or transfer that are sector specific. Uh, um, and then uh, uh, it's going to become our workers workers model that is multiple sector plus incomplete market. So uh, it, it's striking that if you uh, if you think about uh, uh, government spending and transfers in in this model, you can see from our proposition that the fiscal multiplier is one. So you lose the multi like the the the. the the second round of Keynesian cross operating in a standard model with nominal rigidities. And why is that? Because of the nature of the shock. Because if the shock is that you cannot have the feedback effect on the fact that people, that people, uh, uh, um, that government spending is going to increase the income of people, the income of people are going to spend more. They cannot spend more in sector one because they're going to spend more in sector two. But that's not really where it's needed. It's really in what is where it's needed in sector one because it's where the more going to be highest margin. Okay, so fiscal policies are still beneficial because the fiscal multiplier is positive, but they're not as strongly beneficial as uh, in a standard uh, uh, model. How about optimal policy? Uh, so we want to. I mean, this is a stylized uh, version of uh, thinking about optimal policy. Uh, but uh, one important ingredient that we need to add if we want to think in terms of optimal policy is uh, some health dimension. Because, of course, I mean, if we could just not shut down the sectors, that would be optimal. There would be no uh, problem at all. So, but the reason is why we are shutting down some sectors or there may be some, some, some problem, but not as big as if you shut down. But why uh, you, uh, uh, you want to shut down sectors because you think that that is going to help the health uh, of the economy to improve? And so we need that dimension to think more broadly about that. So the way in which we're going to do it is in a very stylized way. We're going to have an additive health component that depends on four things. One on psi, that is the, the shock, shock or no shock, is binary. Um, uh, then the health of an individual depends on his own consumption in sector one and his own work in sector one. So sector one is the contact intensive sector. So if you, um, uh, if you are a uh, both a customer in that sector or a worker in that sector, you're exposed to contact, and so you're exposed of, uh, of the, to the virus. And so that's why the more you 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 are uh, you consume there, the more you work there, the higher the, the lower is your health, and the higher is your negative health shock. And then, and so also the total level of uh, um, of production in sector one is going to affect your health and this is a standard health externality so the more uh, the more active uh, the, the more people the more active the more production there is in sector one there are more contacts there are and the more people are there the, the highest is the chance that you get a virus if you think about restaurants if lots of people are at the restaurants you have a higher chance to get the virus okay uh, and so there are three sources on e of inefficiency in this economy. Again, we are in the complete market multiple sector version of the economy. We have the health externality here, as in a paper by Martin, uh, uh, Sergio, and uh, Trombar. Uh, we have uh, a lack of insurance that comes from the incomplete market components. And then we have, maybe we have also involuntary unemployment. Okay. Because, because working in sector one is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, the, mm, problematic for your health. So what is that? A, a, let's think about a shock, an economy where there is a shock, but the, 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 there are no lockdown policies. So you could potentially work and consume in sector one. 
still, and, and we're not thinking about optimal policy in terms of free remarks, forced, still uh, in this economy where you do not have uh, the lockdown policy, maybe the production and, and output in sector one goes down simply because people in the personal decision, uh, optimal personal decision to work or consume there is to reduce their consumption, their work their, and their labor supply in that sector because of the higher um, virus risk. Um, and so you can have involuntary un unemployment. Uh, but now the first remark is, well, can uh, the, is this unemployment inefficient? Well, no, this unemployment may actually not be socially inefficient. In fact, there are two forces that may make that unemployment efficient or inefficient. On the one hand, you have the Keynesian wedge that, of course, uh, tells us that the unemployment is bad because amplify the demand effect for the rest of the economy. And so this is, of course, cre creates some inefficiency. But on the other hand, you have the given externality that uh, actually it's good that there is unemployment because means that there is less uh, contact in the economy and so less spreading of the virus. Now let's think uh, about remark two. Okay, once we think the shutdown for sector one is optimal uh, because the given externality effect is stronger than the Keynesian wedge effect, well, then uh, this, of course, is going to generate uh, uh, the demand effect of the Keynesian supply shocks that we have talked about. Okay? So um, in that sense, there is some desire for stimulus uh, in, in that dimension. But uh, the mark three is, uh, well, within complete markets, the way in which the stimulus, the, the, the best way to provide that stimulus is through targeted transfers. And targeted transfers can help obtain the first best because they hit the three birds at the same time with one stone which is one, they provide insurance, solving the incomplete market problem. Two, they help raising the natural rate, helping if uh, we are at the zero lower bound. And three, they may make the health policy more desirable because you can uh, directly uh, uh, address the issue, generated, the, the, the issue generated by the policy. And that may be desirable to reduce the spreading of the, to do more, more uh, lockdown policies and reduce the spreading of the virus. Now, um, so socially is uh, uh, necessary and uh, targeted transfer social insurance is key to obtain first bets. So how, uh, now of course this opens a big uh, debate about uh, how to implement this social insurance uh, and how can we think about uh, who, who sh for example, uh, should we um, um, reinforce policies like unemployment insurance or should we reinforce incentive for firms to keep their workers? And so in the, in the paper, we also have an extension where we consider uh, the importance of uh, job matches. So if we are uh, uh, in a, um, a business that has some workers, uh, well, at that, at, at, and you're locked down, at that point, you can keep your worker uh, attached to your firm by paying the wage. This is, of course, a cost. But on the other hand, once uh, the, the sector reopens, your, your workers that is valuable for you because maybe you invested in this human capital, because these uh, skills have been developed in your firm and so forth, then you're, you have this valuable worker tomorrow on. So V1 is the value of the work and that is the wage that you have to pay today. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, you, may des uh, you may decide that the cost of paying the wage is too high and shut down and destroy the match. So what is uh, your choice? Uh, um, what, is, what is that effect of your choice? Well, the interest rate is important in affecting your choice because it determines how, how much more you, you put uh, value you put on the future rather than paying the cost today. And, and the interesting thing is that labor hoarding provide perfect insurance uh, at the same time as a way of providing insurance because it exactly gives the um, uh, keep alive uh, the uh, wage for those workers who are in the lockdown sector. So it kind of reduces the demand uh, um, adverse effect of the lockdown policy. So, uh, so we 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 claim, make the claim that labor hoarding is is positive. Also, if we think a longer run consideration, because in the longer run, when the economy reopens, at that point you are going to have your valuable matches uh, um, back into the picture. And so, uh, both because it provides perfect insurance today and before long run considerations of of uh, efficiency and avoiding job destruction, uh, labor hoarding seems seems optimal. So, it seems good. Uh, to incentivize labor hoarding and monetary policy in general, of course, expansionary monetary policy is going to help in, in that direction because by lowering the interest rate, uh, help uh, uh, firms uh, um, optimally choose uh, to retain their workers. 
Now, of course, uh, there are liquidity issues of firms and so on. So when we think about expansionary monetary policy in that dimension for labor hoarding consideration, we want to think more broadly about uh, the monetary stand and so think about uh, uh, providing liquidity and uh, uh, the, all these type of measures to banks and so forth. It's, all these type of measures are going to help in, a, in terms of uh, uh, give the incentive to the firms uh, and, and give the liquidity to the firms uh, to um, uh, or keep the liquidity in the system alive so that the firms may have access to liquidity to keep their work. Now, uh, I'm going on time. I'm doing bad on time, yeah, right? Um, we have 10 minutes. It's, it's okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, you tell me when, when I have to stop. I'm going to go for. So one more uh, one more issue is uh, um, that I want to touch upon briefly in terms of policies. Well, when we, we want to think about inflation, of course, you have the ECB. So I cannot have. A, I need a slide on inflation, and I want to say our model is very stylized in terms of inflation because we have like stark downward wage rigid, nominal rigidities, and of course, uh, so we have actually no deflation, for example. But the main message of the model, in, if you think about generalization of the model, we can easily generalize the model in a more general uh, standard setting. And the main uh, message of the model in terms of inflation is that demand deficiency means no inflation recession. So when uh, the supply shock is extremely the shock is an end. No inflation, and if anything, deflationary pressure. Uh, and uh, to think about the one way of thinking about the, the mechanism I described before is to think through prices, and I think it's useful to make this point. So, when you think about sector one, what about prices in sector one? We said sector one is price, essentially, it's infinity. So, if you could uh, uh, price uh, the value of going to a restaurant uh, with no risk of getting infected, the uh, so it's like uh, there is a spike in price in the price level, uh, uh, in the shadow price level uh, for sector one. Um, and so this means that actually, if anything, there is going to be a deflationary pressure because tomorrow these prices are going to go back to finance. So a different way to, and this is, you prefer to wait and consume more tomorrow. Okay, so this is a different way of thinking about that. But the main message is that uh, when Keynesian supply shock arises, deflationary pressure may, may be in the in, in the future. And so effect on the real rate uh, is also a deflation, deflationary. These complementarity among sectors that is, it seems important for the for our key results. And as I, I briefly mentioned before, one thing that uh, I want to highlight is that input output linkages are an important way to think about this complementarity stronger. So think about again about our rest accounting services. And these account and uh, uh, then suddenly they stop uh, demanding these accounting services, the demand for the account. immediate input producing non-affected sectors, uh, actually there, there is going to be even stronger demand. The thing is that the supply chains in our, uh, that, that the supply chain make demand, uh, our demand our supply chains from, right? Okay? Uh, not to, uh, so typically people think of supply chain in the other way from uh, uh, upstream to downstream. So thinking about affected sectors uh, that uh, produce intermediate uh, um, good for unaffected sectors. That are not important, but we want to emphasize this, this dimension. So how do we introduce that into the picture? I don't have much time, but the idea is that sector one now uses some intermediate goods that are produced in sector two, and now clearly the uh, upward pressure on natural interest rate is going to be even higher because once you don't have any more the demand in sector two from coming from the demand for the intermediate inputs from sector one, you're going to need even more to generate even more also to kind of compensate uh, for that. And so the effect of the demand effect is going to be even stronger. So a last uh, uh, thing that I want to mention is that, and I mentioned that before uh, briefly, so First of all, these two sectors can be generalized to a continuum of sector. You can potentially generalize it, introducing an intensive measure. If somebody has mentioned before, um, the, the, the one dimension that I want to highlight is that if you have a continuum of sectors, okay, and uh, you have some monopolistic competition that generates profits, uh, 
Um, and you assume uh, that uh, um, each variety is uh, produced by a separate worker from, uh, uh, so extending our model. Well, then uh, basically the results are exactly the same as in our model with incomplete markets and two sets. But then if you add uh, an endogenous exit uh, decision, uh, things becomes, the demand effect becomes even stronger. So if you now add a fixed cost, a random fixed cost of so businesses uh, have to uh, cover a fixed cost to stay active, uh, now it can be that uh, uh, when uh, some fraction of sector shuts down, there is going to be a feedback effect on other sector because this is going to reduce demand in other sectors. But in these other sectors, businesses suddenly may exit because uh, the demand is not going to be enough to cover the fixed cost. And so then this exit is going to feedback in demand from other sector and so on, generating a cascade of exit and amplifying the shutdown, uh, the endogenous shutdown in the economy. I don't have much time, but let me show you this figure. This shows that the, on the x-axis is the active uh, um, firms and uh, businesses, and on the y-axis there is employment uh, at time zero. And you can see that the, the, locus of the, the business exit locus, the intersection between these curves gives us uh, the effective uh, active businesses. And so you can see that in the first, uh, here is before the shock, the intersection is at one minus pi at equal to one, means all businesses are active in steady state. Suddenly, if you have a, you take out one minus five sector from the economy because they're shut down, then the firm exit locus shifts to the left. But then you can see that the intersection between the red and the blue line is going to be at a point that is one minus five, meaning that the enough the active firms are going to be much lower than the one minus five in the economy. So there is more on the top of the, the of the five firms that are shut down. There is going to be an extra number of businesses that are going to exit endogenously, and uh, and this is going to multiply. Okay, so let me conclude. With, conclude with the same uh, um, uh, slide uh, um, table that I showed you at the beginning to re-emphasize our main result. First, uh, uh, single sector, we cannot, the, the supply shock, a pandemic is a simple supply shock. So stimulus is not, but if we introduce multiple sector, and in particular, if you introduce multiple sector with incomplete market and with enough complementarities among sectors, uh, which again can be interpreted in a loose way, especially considering input output linkages, well, then uh, a, a, the pandemic so having demand side demand uh, effects that are stronger than the original supply. And let me mention again the the point the first question somebody asked uh, again uh, now that you have the model in mind I think it's natural to think about uh, how about uh, uh, international like um, context uh, like Europe and think about different sectors at different countries and this is a natural is, a, is an interesting uh, uh, avenue for thought uh, and uh, um, I think that this of course would call for a coordinated policy uh, across countries. Thank you. Many thanks uh, Veronica. Um, one question that came in uh, from Sebastian Schmidt is whether in the context of your model, the type of policies uh, we've seen in Germany, it's called the Kurzarbeit, where the government pays part of a worker's wage without them going to work. Uh, from the kind of labor hoarding perspective, is that a good policy in the model? Yeah. Um, I, I would say so, and this I, I think uh, it's something similar to Casa Integration in Italy, where the government mm -hmm. kind of uh, pay for the workers to stay attached to the firm. Uh, I think that exactly this type of policy in this context uh, seems uh, um, positive. I don't know if my co-authors have anything to add on that dimension. Um, and the second question, uh, I guess, uh, uh, sort of the last question. I mean. Um, there's a lot, I think your, your paper is prompting a lot of thinking uh, here in Europe in terms of more targeted policies, targeting certain sectors, um, of course, primarily in terms of fiscal policy. Um, so as we interact a lot with these policymakers, what's sort of the, the main message coming from the model? I mean, you can also kind of step outside of the model, like what, what sectors to target? Is it sectors with strong complementarities? Um, 
So, um, so um, first of all, I want to say that this is a, a question that is particularly important. Uh, um, so when we are at the, at, the, at the top of the health emergency, like in some countries, like in Italy, for example, where all the sectors are, are, are shut down, of course, uh, then uh, the mechanism that we highlight and then the help of the, of the sector is, is much more difficult to implement at that point, uh, the policy that you want to think are relief type of policy and so forth. But as probably we are going to get out from the extreme lockdown measure, then uh, then you're right that uh, um, then our uh, about different sectors is going to become important and how to target uh, um, that insurance is going to become important. And uh, the the, I mean, one way of thinking about it is, uh, well, of course, you want to target, uh, you want to help the businesses in those and in, in the and the um, and the workers uh, who lose their uh, their job, so that we are attached to sectors uh, that are affected from the mostly affected from the lockdown, because these are the workers that then are going to spend in other sectors, uh, rather than uh, help directly the other sectors that are the ones that. Uh, have uh, complementary, but of course, uh, if uh, anything, uh, if you want to add uh, some uh, some help to other sectors that are uh, active, then uh, you want to. I mean, the model would would would, would call for uh, more action in those sectors that are somehow more linked uh, to the sectors that are shut down. In particular, sectors that produce intermediate input for uh, for uh, sorry, sectors that are producing yes intermediate inputs for those sectors that are shut down so that temporarily have a particular shortage in demand beyond uh, what uh, uh, what would arise if the other sectors were not shut down thank I don't you for my quarters want to add something on that all right i don't hear anything so uh, uh I Oh, what was that? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I just, uh, this is Guido. Yes, Guido, go ahead. All right. Yeah, no, on the on the asymmetry between sectors, I think that is, uh, I, I mean, I, I totally agree with everything that Veronica said. And uh, I, yeah, I, I think the idea is that when all the sectors are shut down, like where, where we are in a really total lockdown, then we're not saying that uh, uh, social insurance is not important. But I guess at that point, policy is essentially doing like disaster relief. You're just helping people that get hurt, but you don't worry at all about restarting activity because it just cannot be done. And so in a sense, like all our, our message is that the moment some sectors can be active, then the question is, are, are these sectors at the right level of activity or are they going to be too depressed? And so we want to help them out. And so I think it's, it's when you start having some asymmetry, when you have to start to have some sectors that could be operating like some manufacturing sector where you can do things without compromising the health of the workers then the question is like is activity in those sectors too too low uh, to what where, where we would want it to be and what kind of interventions can help so the asymmetry is very important well, thank you Dido. so we'll surely be thinking about these issues and working with the input output tables and etc um but unfortunately time is up so i wanted to just uh, end by thanking veronica in a big way for preparing this uh, very interesting presentation for us uh so on behalf of uh, the whole ecb and there were several of our board members on the call as well uh, thank you very much for doing this veronica thank and, you um, uh, please stay healthy all the best <laughs> And I'm um, going to close here for now. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Bye now.